Good morning. Um, today I'm going to speak to you about raised intracranial pressure and its impact on outcome in terms of um, patients with cryptococcal meningitis. What we're trying to achieve today is to help you understand why you get raised intracranial pressure in patients with cryptococcal meningitis, the importance of lowering that pressure and the value of lumbar punctures in particular and to recognize that other treatments for, for raised pressure and cryptococcal meningitis are really not very effective, including steroids. So raised pressure is defined as um, a, a, a centimeters of 20, more than 25 centimeters of water of, or CSF in the manometer. So the normal is up to 19, and um, above between 19 and 25 is regarded as being consistent with elevated pressure, but not something that you would do something special about. But as soon as it's more than 25, um, that require, that is clearly raised intracranial pressure. And the pathophysiology in the context of cryptococcal meningitis is not completely understood. There may be some cytokine-related inflammation, although many patients with end-stage HIV disease or advanced HIV disease don't have very much uh, cytokine elevation. There is some, but it isn't very marked. There may be some cerebral edema, but if it is there, it's pretty minor. What does seem to be a problem is that the um, yeast themselves clog the pathway for uh, resorption of CSF, um, so you get impaired resorption of CSF. So, um, and the rules also, uh, um, Cryptococcus neoformans produces mannitol, and mannitol has a is hyperosmolar and attracts water and it's used uh, of course for the treatment of patients with um, raised intracranial pressure for other reasons to bring water out of the brain because it's given systemically and it may be that it contributes a little bit to raised intracranial pressure but the concentration is quite low so perhaps not uh, it, it, perhaps not a major factor. So the raised intracranial pressure correlates with the CSF fungal burden, and the yeast cells actually prevent CSF outflow. Now, um, adults have a volume of CSF about 150 mils, and, but every day we produce 450 mils. So there's a turnover of about three times of CSF every day. So if the outflow tract is blocked, then you may expect accumulation of fluid and raised pressure. And that's what seems to happen uh, in patients with cryptococcal meningitis. And raised pressure is d definitely associated with a worse outcome, both in morbidity and in morbidity terms as well. Now, the resolution of that raised intracranial pressure is faster if you give the best treatment for cryptococcal meningitis, and that is amphotericin and flucytosine. But before that's had time to work, um, or particularly if you haven't got the best treatment because one of the drugs isn't available or the patients can't tolerate them, then treatment of the raised intracranial pressure itself is important. So the complications of raised intracranial pressure are not dissimilar to other areas. It's quite like benign intracranial hypertension and uh, raised intracranial pressure in the context of tuberculous meningitis and other um, uh, causes of, of chronic subacute meningitis. And if you have it, if the pressure is raised for any length of time, you have reduced consciousness, um, patients are more likely to aspirate, they don't take fluids, they don't take calories, and so it contributes to their overall morbidity and mortality. You also have a relationship between raised intracranial pressure and visual loss, which varies between 16 and 32 percent, so quite a high risk of visual loss, and that's partly related to uh, persistent papilledema, but may also be related to the direct invasion of the cryptococcus on the visual pathways themselves. And there's probably a link with hearing loss as well. Um, that's not quite as clear cut, but it probably is important uh, uh, in, in this context. So other treatments have been tried for cryptococcal meningitis uh, with raised pressure, and they include uh, high-dose steroids, dexamethasone in particular, mannitol treatment, and acetazolamide. And none of these are effective. They do not work. And this is the example in a large study that was done with um, the use of dexamethasone compared with a placebo uh, in cryptococcal meningitis, mostly in Southeast Asia. 
And here you can see those who got dexamethasone actually did worse compared with those who, who did not. So this is not a good treatment. For many years, dexamethasone was thought to be useful for cerebral malaria and was used. And then randomized studies also showed it was ineffective for cerebral malaria as well. So it, this is not, not the right treatment for patients with raised intracranial pressure. And the impact is important. So if you do a single therapeutic lumbar puncture for, lumb for um, uh, patients with, raised, with cryptococcal meningitis, um, then with one LP you can see that the mortality overall in this study, where they looked at this quite carefully, was 16-17%. But if they had, uh, if patients had a raised intracranial pressure and they had a second LP, then actually the chance of dying was much reduced. Um, and that was what, what was sh is shown in this graph here, that a second lumbar puncture is helpful. So, of course, you don't know whether the patient has raised intracranial pressure unless you measure it, which is one of the reasons why we're keen to, to or, or, that pressure is always measured in patients with cryptococcal meningitis on the first time the lumbar puncture is done. Um, but if there's any sense of reduced consciousness or the patient is not improving, then a second lumbar puncture with measurement of pressure is going to be helpful. So the closing pressure is the, um, so the, it's the pressure at the end of the lumbar puncture which really determines whether you need, whether you've got raised intracranial pressure. And so you measure that uh, as, as, uh, when you first do the lumbar puncture and then as you close, if the, if the fluid is coming out, the patient's really quite unwell, then just measure the pressure at the end of um, uh, the lumbar puncture. And if that's raised, then you will definitely need to do another lumbar puncture. Um, if, and then you may need to do more than one more because if the, if the pressure remains high, um, then this is a, a, a group of patients that will do badly. And so they may need a lumbar puncture every second day for several days. And if the pressure still remains high at that stage, then other measures such as a lumbar shunt or a VP shunt uh, are, may be required because you've got essentially the condition of obstructive hydrocephalus that's occurred in the context of um, uh, cryptococcal meningitis in, in these patients. So the ventricular peritoneal shunt um, is a, obviously a surgically implanted um, uh, device. Um, it, it, uh, a connection is made under the skin and it goes through the bone. So there's a hole in the cranial, uh, uh, in the skull itself. Uh, the catheter is placed in one of the lateral ventricles and then fed down into the abdomen through underneath the skin to drain the fluid. And that's essentially a semi-permanent uh, device that's put in. A lumbar drain requires rather more skill at the bedside um, because the patient has to lie flat and it's not as easy to get the pressure right and if, if, the, if the patient sits up too much or other things happen then actually the patients can become quite unwell with a lumbar drain. So the management with the lumbar drain is a little tricky but it's, it's a temporary device and can be removed after the patient gets it improves and doesn't require neurosurgery. So a specialist uh, uh, should be involved in the management of the, the placing and management of these, but this is what you would do if the, if the pressure does not fall. So clearly repeated lumbar punctures are easier and simpler for the patient than doing that. So in summary, raised intracranial pressure in cryptococcal meningitis contributes to death and blindness after cryptococcal meningitis. As the CSF drainage is blocked by the E-cells, mechanical drainage is required and other medical therapies are not effective. The mortality is reduced with two or more lumbar punctures in these patients. And you certainly should not be using steroid therapy in the hope that it will work because it will not and it increases mortality. Many thanks. <coughs>